morning, bom dia, shalom. Um, it's not, you know, it's still, you know, it's 10, 15, yeah, we still have 15 minutes to go with the Portuguese time, so. Um, but since we are here together, uh, I think it's definitely time to, uh, to start. Sorry for this uh, little delay. My name is José Costa. I uh, am a uh, teacher of Portuguese here at BCC, and I'm the director of the uh, Portuguese Center, the BCC Luz ao Santo. I would like to welcome all of you. Um, in the most of all, thank you for coming and joining us to celebrate the life and honor the memory of a great human being, Consul Aristides de Sousa Mendes. I also would like to thank the administration of BCC, President Jack Sprague, Vice President Greg Sataris, Dean Joan Preston for their support. Our thanks to all of our supporters, donors, and volunteers, uh, most of them students from our courses, Portuguese and uh, other courses. A special thank you to our guest speakers, Dr. Douglas Wheeler and Dr. Robert Jakobowicz. And uh, now it's um, my pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, a good friend of ours, he's uh, definitely very known by all of us, Senator Michael Rodriguez. Good morning, everyone. It's really, uh, it's, it's really, this, I've been looking forward to this since I first heard about this, and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Zach Costa for organizing this event. Um, so we, so I can learn more, and we can all learn more about a, about a human being who I consider a real hero of mine. Um, since I first heard of the story, I grew up with the story of Aristides Souza Mendes. Um, I've just been uh, wanting to learn more and more about him. And also, as I have spent the last many years, as many of you know, working on the restoration of the oldest synagogue in Portugal, in Ponta Delgada, and I'm happy to say that it's almost completely restored and will be opened uh, next spring uh, in April, um, I have really focused a lot of my time and my spare time uh, learning about the history of not only Aristides Souza Mendes, but also the history of the Luzo and Judeo relations and, and how intertwined they were over, uh, over the centuries. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, and um, what I would also like to do, and I've been asked to do, we, uh, we in Massachusetts uh, lost a very special gentleman yesterday. Uh, hero amongst among many people, the longest serving mayor uh, for the city of Boston. Uh, over 20 years he was mayor of Boston a fine man, and I'd like to ask if we could just have a moment of silence in memory of Mayor Tom Nino. Thank you very much. Please enjoy the day. I really look forward to it. Thank you for including me and inviting me and for putting this together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Michael Rodriguez. And uh, by the way, thank you very much for uh, giving uh, this uh, prizes for our raffle today. Uh, two copies of the, the book uh, about the uh, Ponta Delgada Synagogue. Uh, besides that great trip to the State House and, uh, you know, field trip with a lunch with you. Um, so uh, I also would like to. Uh, to recognize in, uh, in the audience uh, our good friend, and he is a member of the um, Luzo Central Advisory Board, uh, Honorable uh, Philip Raposa. Thank you very much for coming. And now it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pedro Carneiro, 
Dr. Pedro Carneiro is the Consul of Portugal in New Bedford. Dr. Pedro? Good morning, everybody. Um, President Sprega, uh, State Senator Michael Rodrigues, uh, dear friend Judge Raposa, Professor Jose Costa, Dr. Ron, uh, Ron uh, Weisberger, members of the BCC, uh, dear speakers, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today for this uh, important event, important occasion. And I would like to, uh, first of all, to thank the BCC, the Bristol Community College, uh, the Luso Centro, Professor José Costa, and also the BCC Holocaust Center uh, for uh, putting this together, this, this, this program. It's a, um, a really important event. And uh, when Professor José Costa some months ago, he told me, uh, you know, he was planning uh, with some other people to, uh, to uh, organize this. I, uh, I immediately uh, encouraged and, uh, and told him I want to, you know, be part of it. I want to support it. And here we are today. So congratulations uh, for this work. Um, I'd like very briefly uh, to say that the story that most of you know already, but some of you perhaps don't know, uh, in detail, it's 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 a very dramatic dramatic story. Uh, it um, the the story of Sosa Mendes um, in its most important point, in its moment when it was transformative, uh, can be uh, put in a very simple way. Uh, Sosa Mendes was a consul, Portuguese consul in Bordeaux in France during the Second World War. And in, that, in the turmoil of the, of the war, he received very restrictive instructions from the Portuguese government, basically limiting his uh, ability to grant visas. And uh, he thought a lot about it and decided to disobey that instruction. He decided to disobey those orders and he chose to grant visas for an estimated number of 30,000 30, people. Uh, putting things in these terms sounds very simple, but in reality it was very, very complex and raised a lot of moral and even philosophical questions. And what makes Sosa Mendes really a remarkable human being, and you'll hear more about that later, is that his, 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 his ability to pursue the highest levels of ethical behavior, even in times of war and repression, and even with the prospect of personal injury or loss. And so the men decided or chose to submit to moral obligation. And he chose to act, and he chose to do something, he used his power to help thousands of people. So Zemenj, through his thinking, through his perplexity, and uh, through his actions, refused to succumb to the banality of evil, using that famous expression of Anna Arendt. He refused in conscience to be one more amongst a mass of citizens, and he refused to not act. His decision was based on his freedom of conscience, but this also made him a pariah. And as you know, he was banned for, from working life, and even beyond death, uh, his name took time to be rehabilitated. Um, in fact, let me just briefly mention uh, 
from the Portuguese government point of view. Uh, Aristides Sousa Mendes' uh, punitive proceedings were first reviewed in 1976, but the official rehabilitation of Sousa Mendes only really happened from 1987 mm -hmm. over onwards. He was reinstated as ambassador in 1988, and in 1995, he was awarded the most important Portuguese civil decoration. And also in 2000, the Portuguese government granted to the Aristide Sousa Mendes Foundation in Portugal some uh, $250,000 uh, for, the, for the work of the foundation. Uh, and also to honor the memory of the late diplomat. So, here in the US there is also the, the Sousa Mendes Foundation, here represented, uh, and uh, it also uh, holds a very, very important role that I'd like to uh, recognize here. The Sousa Mendes Museum and Human Rights Center in Portugal that will be based in Casa do Passal, in Portugal, in Cabanas do Viriato. The, 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 it's very ironic that the house of Sousa Mendes in uh, Cabanas do Viriato is only 13 miles from Salazar's hometown, Santa Combadão. And as you know, Salazar was the man who basically destroyed Sousa Mendes' life and career. And ironically, these two small cities are 13 miles apart. And also ironically, and history turns around and gives some twists, um, the house of Salazar is destroyed in ruins and the house, finally the house of Sousa Mendes is now being rehabilitated and the works of renovation have started late, late, last May 2014, this year. And we are very happy for that. And the Portuguese government also contributed for that. So, uh, also, the Portuguese government decided to create, some time ago, the virtual museum of Aristides de Sousa Mendes. It is something that you can go to the computer, you Google uh, Museu Virtual, virtual museum of Aristides de Sousa Mendes, and uh, you can access a lot of data, videos, photos, and uh, images, historical da data. In unfortunately, it's, it's only in Portuguese, but uh, hopefully it will also be uh, uh, in other languages and English uh, in, the, in the near future. But it's something that I invite you also to, 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 uh, to see. And um, let me just finish by saying that last May, at the UMass Dartmouth, there was also an event honoring uh, Sousa Mendes organized by the Sousa Mendes Foundation um, here in the US. And it was, the event was introduced by Mr. Harry Osterreicher. Uh, and he, the first words he said when he spoke to the audience was, I'm here, Mr. Osterreicher said, I'm here because my father and my grandfather received exit visas from Sousa Mendes. And when you hear these kind of words, you really understand the true value and the true importance and relevance of what Sousa Mendes did. So thank you very much for holding this event and I hope you have a great, great day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Pedro Carneiro. Thank you very much for your support. And now I, I would like to introduce my dear friend and colleague, um, Dr. Ron Weisberger. He is the director of the uh, Holocaust Center at BCC. Ron. Thank you, Jose. Um, I, of course, would like to welcome you also. And really pleased with the reception we've received uh, from the community and, and from the college. Um, we're, we've been really, the Holocaust Center has really been pleased to uh, work together 
and I personally worked together with Jose Costa, Dr. Jose Costa. Um, I've learned uh, a lot working with him, and collaboration is always wonderful, and this is the result of that. So uh, this is uh, really great. Um, I uh, would like to, first of all, bring to the podium the president of Bristol Community College, Dr. Jacques Sabrega, who um, he and the college have been very supportive of this event and, of course, the Holocaust Center in general. Thank you, Dr. Reisberger, and welcome, everyone, to Bristol Community College. What a great event this is. You know, it marries a couple of uh, very important priorities for uh, Bristol Community College. Our wonderful Lusso Centro uh, has been created under the great guidance of uh, Dr. Jose Costa and those, and the support from the community to, to really move forward with cultural activities uh, affecting the Lusso world, if you will, in the Southeastern Mass, but across the Commonwealth and beyond. Uh, we're very proud of what has come uh, from modest beginnings. Uh, we had no budget, we had no office, uh, we had very little uh, to what it has grown to uh, now be well recognized uh, uh, across the uh, Commonwealth. And the second is our Holocaust Center. Uh, uh, Dr. Ronald Weisberger has been uh, instrumental in, uh, in moving forward with this. Uh, not coincidentally, uh, Dr. Costa has written and published and spoken uh, many times about uh, Lusso, Lusso Central affairs, not just the Lusso Central. And also, uh, Dr. Weisberger and another faculty member at uh, Bristol Community College, Dr. Howard Tinberg, have recently published uh, last year, a couple years ago now, a, uh, a book on teaching of the Holocaust. So these, uh, these two, uh, this is a perfect merger of uh, wonderful things that are happening at Bristol Community College. And I would be remiss not to uh, also mention a number of dignitaries in the office, but in the audience, but I would want to mention to you that Senator Rodericks has been instrumental, a driving force in, um, in bringing together these two movements, the Lusso Central and uh, Holocaust Studies, in his own work, in, uh, 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 instrumental in the uh, uh, synagogue in, uh, in Ponte de Gata, as well as all things that, that are affected by, uh, by these topics. You know, we, we feel at uh, Bristol Community College that uh, by educating the holis a holistic experience uh, for our students, that on a modest level, of course I'm not comparing, but that uh, people uh, f coming through Bristol Community College as a result of their experience will be able to step up and make, uh, make decisions that uh, benefit society not on the scale of social men's, on, on, you know, that we hope we'd never need again. But um, uh, I like to say that the purpose of the uh, uh, education at Bristol Community College is not simply to uh, produce contributing citizens who are informed. Rather, our purpose is to produce informed citizens who can make ethical choices. And I think the, the hero of our uh, topic today uh, demonstrates the importance of making heroic and informed and ethical choices. You just say, I cannot go any further. It's not, it's not me. I will not do this. And uh, on a smaller scale, I like to uh, feel that uh, we, we contribute at Bristol Community College to that, that type of holistic uh, education that will bring forward our students uh, as they face some difficult choices throughout their lives. Uh, so it's going to be a wonderful day today. Uh, I hope that all, all goes well uh, for everyone. I wish them well. I want to particularly thank uh, Mr. Jakovitz and also Professor Wheeler uh, for taking time out of their schedules to, uh, to help us and contribute to this wonderful dialogue. And uh, I know that uh, there'll be more uh, to say about this, not just today, but in the future. Uh, uh, Social Men's is not something, not someone that we want to ever forget uh, for the her heroism uh, that he displayed at, at great personal cost, as, uh, as the council has pointed out. So I thank you. I wish you well. And uh, please enjoy the day and contribute, uh, continue to contribute uh, your ideas in this free exchange of ideas as we do at this academic uh, institution. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Weisberger. Thank you.
Um, before we uh, begin our program as such, uh, there's a number of um, sort of introductions and thank yous that we want to uh, do first because, as you know, something like this doesn't just happen. <clears throat> um, first of all, um, we want to thank our uh, sponsors who have helped fund this. And it's on the back of your program, but I'll just mention um, uh, very quickly, FLOD, which is a Luso-American Developmental Foundation, the Camus Institute, the Portuguese Council, Consulate in New Bedford, which you just heard, the Consul, the Jewish Federation of New Bedford, and the, Jew the um, Holocaust Education Committee of, um, of the Jewish Federation, in which uh, we have some a number of people represented here, including um, Cindy Yokin, who is a co-chair along with uh, Maria Reed, they're up here somewhere. But they've been uh, a committee that I've been part of for a number of years, and they've done yeoman's work in supporting Holocaust education throughout this area. So we, we really thank them for their support. Jewish Federation of New Bedford uh, as well, and uh, Ellen Hall, who's the chair president, is also here somewhere in the audience. So we want to thank them. Um, See, a BCC Multicultural Committee as well, uh, the BCC Division of Humanities and Education, uh, TA Restaurant and Azores Bakery, who, uh, by the way, lunch will be beginning probably around 12.15, and they've uh, supported us in providing that lunch. <clears throat> we have a number of, uh, we have a raffle out there, I'm sure you've seen, and a uh, number of people have great, you know, have contributed to very quickly Dr. Odetto. Amarello, the Woodside De Dental Care, TA Restaurant, Senator Michael Rodericks, um, the Follett Higher Education Group, and Jay Marshall Associates have all contributed to our raffle. And uh, we really appreciate that. The, fun the, um, the money we raise will go both to the Luzo Centro and to uh, the BCD Holocaust Center. So, um, so we thank all of that, all those folks. I don't know. Sure, I leave somebody out, but uh, just final thing, I want to thank directly two individuals for who have made this all possible. Um, one of those people who's probably out there is Linnell Dean, who has really coordinated so much of this, and Joanne Petrasso, who also has, uh, from the beginning, has contributed. So I don't know if they're there. You want to stand up if you're out there, or probably. Uh, probably out in the back there, uh, still helping out. But anyway, those two people along with Jose and I have really, um, you know, without them we wouldn't have had a conference. So anyway, I want to recognize all those folks. Um, we are, we were possibly expecting maybe uh, Mayor Will Flanagan, who wanted to bring a proclamation, but uh, they show up. But in any case, uh, I think we're ready now uh, to begin. Oh, I want to mention one other thing, sorry. There's a uh, portrait out there you may notice it's a reproduction, beautiful, by uh, Deborah Macy, who I think is here or will be here. And uh, this is courtesy, uh, Diane Bolton, part of our committee, brought it here with her own two hands. And it's courtesy of the New Bedford Free Public Library trustees. It's copyrighted. You can take pictures with it. You can't sell it out there. But anyway, uh, we really appreciate her, Diane Bolton, and the New Bedford Library contributing so we get to see what a handsome man we're talking about today. All right, so with all that, um, I want to bring back my colleague, Jose Costa, who I think will introduce our first speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. And uh, gee, I, I was feeling like saying, now back to business. Um, but uh, definitely, we we uh, we thank you, and uh, thank all of our supporters. And without your presence, well, there would not be conference. Definitely not. Um, and now I would like uh, to uh, to introduce. It is my pleasure and honor to introduce our first guest speaker, Dr. Um, Douglas Wheeler. Is uh, a professor of history emeritus. Uh, of the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Wheeler is a uh, lecturer, consultant, editor, and author. He's a master's degree 
in the PhD in history from the Boston University. He has been associated with the University of New Hampshire for more than 45 years as uh, a professor and chair of the uh, history department. <clears throat> he has taught history courses and seminars at uh, University of New Hampshire, Boston University, universities in Europe and Africa. And the main focus of those courses uh, is on the history of modern Spain and Portugal, history of Africa, history of the Portuguese Empire, revolutions in Spain and Portugal. Professor Wheeler has also lectured widely in New England and abroad on the history of international intelligence and espionage, as well as on intelligence after 9-11. Uh, Professor Dr. Wheeler is the author of eight books, co-author and co-editor on topics including History of Angola, History of Modern Portugal, Republican Portugal, and historical, the Historical Dictionary on Portugal. He is the founder of the academic journal Portuguese Studies uh, Review and was editor of the Portuguese Studies Newsletter. He is a member of several advisory boards of international journals in Portugal, England, Canada, and United States. <clears throat> he has published more uh, or over uh, 300 articles, review essays, journals, and magazines, newspapers, encyclopedias, including Foreign Affairs, USA Today, Encyclopedia Britannica, Journal of Modern History, and Historia Política de Portugal. His scholarship uh, has been translated into Portuguese, uh, Spanish, French, and German. Professor Wheeler is the recipient of several honors and awards, including the Order of Prince Harry uh, the Navigator and the Order of Liberty, both awarded by presidents of Portugal for scholarship and teaching on Portuguese history and culture. So, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Douglas Willer. With that, after that introduction, I think I'd better quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here uh, at this uh, very special college. I understand from Dr. Costa that uh, uh, you're having a 50, 50th anniversary of Bristol Community College. And that's very special. Uh, I just had a um, little more than a 53rd anniversary from the first time I set foot in the wonderful country of Portugal in 1961 as a Fulbright student on exchange. Uh, and that's when the Fulbright program began in Portugal. Um, this is a history talk, but I want to start off as though it's a parable about a Good Samaritan and begin reading Luke 10 and end the final part of Luke 10 before I show a few slides. And also there's a handout uh, which I'll refer to later and I hope most of you or all of you have that with a little bibliography at the end and a picture of um, an artist's rendition of Bordeaux on a very um, um, conflicted day in June 1940, and I'll refer to that in, in the talk. I'm reading from Luke 10, chapters 25 to 29, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, Jesus Christ, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and they, thy neighbor as thyself. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And who is my neighbor? Reading from my article of 1989 from the Luso Brazilian Review, and by the way, I know the conventional wisdom in academia 
and many uh, universities says, when you begin to quote yourself, you should retire. <laughs> For the, about, um, it's almost 30 years ago now, in the um, mid to late 80s, a historian of 20th century Portugal, when I began some of this work, Holocaust Studies or World War II and its Neutrality, at first, this case appears to hold little interest. In July 1940, an obscure Portuguese consul in Bordeaux, a member of his country's elite, was removed from his post by Foreign Minister Salazar. He disobeyed orders in signing visas for refugees. Forsaken by his government, he saw his career ended. Recent research on Portugal's record as a neutral country in World War II suggests that almost from the beginning, while maintaining scrupulous neutrality officially, the Salazar regime, in fact, tended to be more pro-allied uh, than uh, pro-Axis. Thank you. In 30 years of post-war oppositionist literature in Portugal, there is no mention of this case of a devout Catholic diplomat who for 30 years was the loyal servant of the state he served before his sudden fall from grace. Unlike Enrique Galvão, Consul Sosa Mendes never hijacked an ocean liner at sea or made the pages of Life magazine, never ran for the presidency of the Republic or plotted to overthrow it like Delgado, never stood public trial or suffered in police prisons or went into exile, never defended oppositionists as a lawyer, but only himself and his family and unlike Raoul Wallenberg, he did not disappear into Soviet prisons, but only into the myths of Beira Alta and into poorer sections of Lisbon. The story of this um, Good Samaritan is a, in many ways, although Bordeaux and the frontier with France and Spain was the heart of the of his actions in 1940. It's a, almost a global story uh, involving the Portuguese diaspora, his Sousa Mendes' family diaspora, because every child of the 13 and his, who survived in his family, they all immigrated from Portugal with one possible exception and went to various countries uh, in the world. And Sosa Mendes, as a consul, was very much a, uh, someone who was moving around in different countries before he ended up in Bordeaux at the end of his career. So I would like to show uh, the first slide, which is a map of the world showing where uh, the Portuguese-speaking world uh, was and where the empire was. Could we have the lights dimmed? And I guess I hit this. Oh, we want to go back. There we are. Could we have the lights dimmed a bit? Can you see, can you see that? Posted to uh, Belgium, Antwerp, before he was, uh, went to Bordeaux in France. He was in East Africa at Zanzibar. He was um, in Brazil, uh, especially in the Rio area. And he was in the United States. Um, and so in a way, his uh, career was a, was a global one. I'll just show a few of these um, slides. This is a conventional one of uh, the early uh, photos of the couple, um, Angela and um, 
Aristides de Sousa Mendes. Just to give you a sense, this is a, um, um, a photo when he was in Antwerp, I believe, uh, a little older, with his diplomatic uniform. This is when he was a little, um, perhaps on his way to, uh, to Belgium. This is some of the um, family, an earlier picture. Not all of the 13 children, but a number of them. This is a, a, a picture of dictator Salazar uh, next to General Carmona, who was one of the people who put him into power in 1928, first as Minister of Finance and then as later as Prime Minister. A different kind of authoritarian system, um, and historians are debating today what, how fascist was the Salazar regime, or was it uh, more Catholic, more conservative, more monarchist? And in fact, the Sosa Mendes family were monarchists, and they didn't like the republic. So this is one of the inner political issues that affected uh, the career of Sosa Mendes. This is one of the one of the most iconic pictures of. Uh, the face of someone who might have been about to be a refugee in the streets of Paris when the German troops marched in in the middle of June, uh, just about the time that the, uh, in Bordeaux there was a terrible crisis of refugees uh, where Sosa Mendes had to act. But this Frenchman is weeping as he sees German troops marching along the, uh, through the Ar Ar Arche de Triomphe on the Champs-Élysées and some people behind him um, this, this was a turning point in history when the, the phony war, where there wasn't much fighting, suddenly ended and the Low Countries, Luxembourg, Belgium, Holland, and France were taken by the Germans and uh, they were defeated. And so much of Western Europe became a German-occupied area. Next slide, please. I'm sorry, I've got the... Uh, Some of the refugees, um, it's sort of a little bit blurred there, but showing up children on a cart that somebody is pushing. And literally, um, in uh, June, uh, May and June 1940, the, the world's greatest refugee crisis, catastrophe, hit Western Europe. Uh, possibly the worst refugee crisis since the 15th century or earlier in Europe where people uh, to flee France and the Low Countries fled on the roads. Uh, if they, could take, a, if they could take a bus, trains were filled. There weren't many ships. Uh, there were virtually no planes. Most planes had only 20 seats. Everything was filled, so people walked or used bicycles. And you're talking five to eight million people on the roads of Western Europe trying to find refuge. Um, many, of, many of them headed for Bordeaux, and their goal was to get to, through Spain to Portugal. And it wasn't easy because Spain, at one point, closed the border with France. And so but people were stuck in France. And so one of the, the points of Sosa Mendes's actions was to get the transit visas so people could get to Portugal. And this is a scene from uh, Warsaw after the Germans took Poland, showing um, a Jew being arrested by the Gestapo. This was the, in the backyard of the Casa du Passal at Cabanas du Viriato. Uh, Sosa Mendes had a, a statue to Christ built, which was in his backyard. Uh, and finally, uh, just a year before his wife, Angelina, died, this is a photo of the couple, the elderly couple. Um, uh, and, and, and you can tell that she looks um, distressed there.
And that's a picture of some of the, um, uh, the history of the diaspora. Okay, that's, uh, I want to finish, that's, that's the end of the slides. Actually, no, I think I might have one more. This is from the town of Seya, a little north of um, Cabanas de Vidiato, where the, uh, an iconic statue of, the Portug of a Portuguese migrant, immigrant, going abroad with his suitcase. This was built sometime in the 19, um, after World War II. Finally, in Yad Vashem, one of the plaques honoring Sozomenish as a righteous Gentile. And this is a photo from the 1980s or 90s of the, um, the mansion of the family in, in a ruined state. And I know that in May, the um, funds began to rehabilitate this mansion and make it into a, um, a Holocaust museum, but also a world refugee museum, and also honoring Sosa Mendish. Uh, I went through this in 1992, this place, um, and until recently it, it, was, it looked just like this, a total ruin. Um, and a, a, a very, this was sort of the end of a, very, of a sad story. Okay. So what was the context of um, Sosa Mendish career, and what was the, the story of his disobeying his government? The context was that he was a diplomat, as was his twin brother, Cesar, but they were in different tracks of the Foreign Service. And so Sosa Mendish was in the consular track, and when he got to Bordeaux, he, had, he was promoted to consul for his class. But his brother, Cesar, his twin brother, was in the ambassadorial class, so that he was, uh, in effect, uh, an ambassador in various countries. Even more so, Cesar had been foreign minister briefly under Salazar in the early 1930s, but he had been uh, very quickly fired by Salazar. Um, his career was definitely negatively affected by his brother's tragic uh, end of his career. And for the rest of World War II, Cesar was not assigned a post. But beginning in 1945, he got some posts again and then retired uh, later. He died one year after his exactly one year, almost to the day, uh, as his twin. And even though he tried to help his brother, uh, he was unable to do, to do very much. So this is one of the stories. Uh, it, it's definitely a family story as well, uh, in the fact that all 13 children migrated after the war because they felt they could not find or could not get the kind of jobs they wanted or needed, and so they went abroad to Africa, uh, the Congo, Angola, Mozambique, they went to Belgium, they went to France, they went to Canada, they went to the United States. So the surviving children were, uh, were in these countries, although several of them have returned to Portugal. The context of the, uh, the government was that the Salazar regime was um, like many dictatorships, but it was also different. It was like many dictatorships in that it had a lot of rules and regulations. Um, the diplomats were no exception. So the visas, passports, were very carefully regulated. Uh, and one of the pressures that was part of the Sosa Mendes story was the Depression was a, an economic crisis that was unprecedented. And even in 1940, much of the world was still in the grip of the Depression. And one of the things that many governments did was to keep migrants or immigrants who did not have a place or a job or support in the country they were migrating to, to try to keep them out. 
So this kind of regulation of preventing people who, say, didn't have any funds to live in Portugal, or didn't have any contacts or a job, it wasn't surprising that there would be a restriction, uh, say, b certainly before the war got hot in the summer of 1940, restrictions that even Sweden, um, other countries in the North, in the United States, Canada, restri uh, quite restricted uh, immigrants. Uh, the question of of passports was a particularly sensitive one, and um, many of you, we all have to deal with passports at airports or at ports or whatever, but I, I, you can blame the passport phenomenon uh, on, a, on, on World War I, because when you study the history of intelligence, you discover that before 1914, most people in any country except for diplomats and certain business people, did not have to carry passports. But beginning in the fall of 1914, the Allies and the Central Powers were so frightened of spies coming in as migrants that they began to, uh, they required that everybody have a passport, everybody, every, everyone who crossed a border or entered a port or uh, entered an airfield. And so everybody from then on had to have a passport, usually with a fee to pay. This was not unusual. But one of the um, things that happened, one of the pressures on Sosa Mendes was people who were afraid of being caught by the Gestapo uh, and, and sent to a, a death camp. Uh, even before they knew there were real death camps, there were suspicions that a lot of people were being Killed. So certain people from Austria, Czechoslovakia, Poland were aware that something was going on, even if the Allies uh, uh, didn't recognize that. And so they tried to change their identities, and this had to be done through a passport. So one of the um, regulations which Sosa Mendes broke when he uh, did his amazing things in 1939 and 40 was to give someone a passport where the person had a changed identity in order to save him or save the family from being arrested in France. And uh, another issue was that if anyone, a young person, a young man of military age, being between 17 and 30 in much of the world, was traveling, this was uh, granting them a passport or a visa was forbidden often by the French and by the Germans. Um, and so that if you gave a passport or visa to someone like that, that was against the law. Now what Portugal, as a neutral country, trying to satisfy both the Allies and the Axis, it wasn't easy. And one of the fears of the Salazar government, which was not totally irrational, was that if too many migrants that looked suspicious to the Germans, suspicious meaning they were uh, Jews, um, or they had been part of the opposition to the German, to Hitler, or they were communists, or they were even Russians, would particularly be, uh, those visas would not be granted. They would not be, they would be, uh, uh, especially if a large number of them arrived, the Germans would then say, well, we thought you were neutral. You're favoring a certain group in your granting of passports. So this, these were um, particularly a sensitive issue in 1940 when there was a possibility that Germany would invade Spain and then if they did that, they would certainly uh, take Gibraltar, from, which was still a British colony. In fact, it is today. Uh, uh, and then they'd move to Portugal. And so there were some sensitive issues um, here in November 1939, Circular 14 arrived from Lisbon. By the way, one of the frustrations was that the government in Lisbon answered Sosa Mendes's desperate telegrams during this crisis, if, if at all, very slowly. And this was frustrating because he needed to ask permission for many of these visas, and he wasn't getting it not only where they forbidding them, but when he did ask for special cases, they took a long time to answer. And this was all by telegram. 
So you can see the record we have in the archives of Portugal and um, um, the Jewish archives in New York and elsewhere. We have the records of these telegrams that were sent. What can I do about, what, what should I do about a visa for this? Eventually he, he gave up and decided that he, uh, after he met a Polish rabbi named Kruger, who said, I have hundreds of people in the street behind me, and you can see the, the artist renders this picture. It must be 100,000 people in that square outside the Portuguese uh, uh, crossing the bridge into Bordeaux. Uh, the people behind me need visas, so I'm not going to ask, as a rabbi, I have to set an example, I'm not going to ask for a visa till you give everybody else a visa. So one of the Historians believe that one of the major influences on Sosa Mendes was not only his faith uh, as a devout Catholic, but also his sense of um, uh, what was right, but also uh, Kruger having long conversations with him about uh, what he believed were already death camps in Poland. Although uh, Kruger was living in Belgium, he heard a lot from survivors he knew in Poland, who were Poland now being occupied by, by Germany as well as by Russia. Uh, so the, um, one of the first things he said, I will read to you from one of the documents where he was defending himself in a trial that was carried on in the foreign ministry. My government, and he also said to uh, people who were at the door of his consulate, my government has denied all applications for visas to any refugee, but I cannot allow these people to die. Many are Jews, and our Constitution says that religion or the politics of, um, of, of a foreigner shall not be used to deny his refuge, uh, deny him or her refuge in Portugal. I have decided to follow this principle. I'm going to issue a visa to anyone who asks for it, regardless of whether they can or cannot pay. I know that Mrs. de Sousa Mendes will agree with me. Even if I am fired, discharged, I can only act as a Christian and as my conscience tells me. Later in his defense and the documents he submitted in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the, when he returned to Portugal, he wrote, it was really my objective to save all these people whose suffering was indescribable. Some had lost their spouses. Others had no word of their lost children. Some had seen loved ones die under the German bombardments. By the way, Bordeaux was bombed one of those days in the middle of June. The Luftwaffe bombed a section of Bordeaux, not the street where the consul of Portugal was, but somewhere in the city of Bordeaux which put more terror in the, uh, the, the legions of the desperate refugees. And there was even more pressure uh, for visas to get to, get to Portugal. Um, these terrified fugitives, but beyond this extremely emotional aspect, which filled me with deep sympathy for such misfortune, there was something that couldn't be ignored. The fate that was reserved for so many people, they fell into the hands of the enemy and note that word, his use of the word enemy. And as a neutral diplomat, but by this time he'd been basically fired and he was in Lisbon, um, instead of saying Germany or the Third Reich or Hitler's forces, he said the enemy. Who were the people that got these visas? This is an entire, uh, worth a seminar of several weeks and two, at least 2,000 of them have been identified because of the, of, of the visas they got. And they are uh, on record at the Sosa Mendes Foundation. Uh, and the, the, the list is growing. That raises, of course, the question of how many visas overall during this period of several weeks from uh, uh, during most of June, not only in Bordeaux, but also at the f Spanish, French frontier, when Sosa Mendes traveled down there once and twice and instructed subordinates at vice consulates on the French-Spanish border 
to sign more visas or did them personally, or even walked across in one case into Spain with some refugees uh, uh, and giving them, um, uh, re uh, in other words, uh, telling the Spanish guards that they had to uh, let, let them through. Who were some of these people? I just want to l uh, read a small list of the most, of the most celebrated, and um, that would include um, the, you, you'll be very surprised because there's a lot of cultural history of the United States uh, in, in showing um, that the, the, the survivors who got these visas um, contributed to the world, and they, they owed this to Sosa Mendes. They contributed a variety of things. There were writers, poets, um, there were the people who created the cartoon Curious George, you'd be surprised to learn, Mr. and Mrs. Ray, R-E-Y, they were Jewish. They were, they were saved with visas from two actors from the film Casablanca. And this is very ironic and very uh, almost like serendipity because if you've seen the film recently of Casablanca, there, may, there are a number of lines in it where um, the people are trying to get out of Casablanca, which is French controlled, uh, Vichy controlled French Africa, and they're trying to get to Lisbon as the crossroads to get to England or get to the United States or get to the Americas to get away. And um, they, uh, they say in the film at least three times, you'll be okay in Lisbon. You're getting to Lisbon. It's all set in Lisbon. Well, in the uh, Rick's Cafe's uh, gambling casino, the man running the roulette wheel uh, Marcel Dalio was saved by one of Sosa Mendes's and, and, and went to Hollywood and acted in this film which came out in late 1942 or 43. And another uh, actor who was a, a woman who was singing in the cafe when everyone got up and sang the Marseillaise. Uh, quite a moving um, thing. One of the Rothschilds the French banking family, uh, Jewish banking family from Paris. Maurice, he was saved by a visa. And you had also many, uh, many, many others. And it's a story which is um, really quite, quite amazing. Salvador Dali got a visa, and his wife, who was Russian, was very lucky to get a visa because of the regulations of Circular 14 from the Portuguese government, which said, we, we, we will not grant Russians visas because they didn't give the reason, but the reason was that the government of Salazar was extremely uh, anti-communist even at that stage, and Russians were considered to be um, uh, suspect, whatever their police record or lack of record or, or, or whatever. So it was very hard for a Russian to, but Mrs. Dolly, because of what happened in Bordeaux, <clears throat> was able to get a visa uh, from the Portuguese government. And there are a number of ironies here. The, um, when, when the Portuguese government in Lisbon and the, um, our, their ambassador, uh, Teotonio Pereira in, in Madrid, discovered that there were all these people with visas coming to go to Portugal, they at first, well, they, they fired Sosa Mendes, and they asked him to go back to Lisbon but also they d tried to deny that any of these visas were valid. And one of the most amazing things that happened, it's quite moving, was that when these thousands of people began to filter into Portugal, and it wasn't easy crossing Spain, because it had had a three-year civil war where 500,000 people died, Franco was still shooting people in the prisons even after the war, and the roads were ruined, the country was in terrible, terrible shape, uh, and if you got sent to a camp in, in Spain for inter interning um, refugees, it was very bad conditions. But somehow they got to the Portuguese border, some of them even walking, taking a train, taking a truck, getting a ride, whatever. With few exceptions, <coughs> no one was turned back. 
it was merely a matter of waiting in line or waiting to get in. Even if you had to wait a week at Villa Formosa or one of the other uh, frontier points, people did that and then they got to Portugal. But one exception was that a couple of years after the Sosa Mendes incident, a train load from Holland that had come through, Spain, through France and Spain that had a number of Jews on it was turned back, was turned back at the Portuguese border. And as far as we know, that was the only exception. Uh, we don't know the total numbers, either of those who got visas or who actually came to Portugal. Historians believe that a little under a million people ended up as refugees during World War II in Portugal. Most of them came during late 1939 or during all of 1940 and into 41, and then the numbers began to, to decline. <coughs> As for the number of visas signed by Sosa Mendes, the estimates uh, are anywhere from 3,000 to 30,000. And of that uh, number, the uh, number who were Jews, we, we don't know, but it was quite a large, uh, quite a large number. And now, the, thanks to the Sosa Mendes Foundation, uh, we are identifying through the survivors who have kept passports and kept visas from their um, relatives, we are now able to document the actual numbers. But there's some problems <coughs> with that because all the visas were not signed in Bordeaux, but some were signed on the Franco-Spanish border at three or four towns. <coughs> and so they were, we don't have all those numbers, we don't have all those records. Uh, this is a story which is really quite, um, quite amazing. I do want to, um, oh, I mentioned one of the actors, I didn't forget, I, I did forget Robert Montgomery, Montgomery, one of the Hollywood actors uh, who was saved by a, by a visa from Sosa Mandish. A famous uh, professor of philosophy, Sylvain Bromberger, who I believe is still alive, was an MIT professor, and he had a visa from Sosa Mendes. Finally, the heir to the Austrian throne, someone who was an opponent of Hitler, Otto von Habsburg, got a visa from Sosa, Sosa Mendes, and ended up, I think, living in Madeira for a while. Um, so the people that the Germans were interested in catching and uh, imprisoning were not simply the Jews, but also anyone who had opposed them <coughs> or had been, even if they were a monarchist and they wanted a constitutional monarchy, they were against the Nazis. That was the case of Otto von Habsburg, and there were, and there were others. Uh, this is an amazing story of a good Samaritan, uh, one that um, we can all admire. The flavor of Lisbon in 1940 was bizarre. And you had a kind of, it wasn't only the refugees, but you had uh, famous people who had to get to other parts of the world only through Lisbon. Because the, Lis the port of Lisbon and the airport of Lisbon, and sometimes the port of uh, Porto, were the only places where the ships were going to the Americas, or even going to England. England, though, was a problem because it was being bombed. So people often did not want to go to England. One of the top spies of the British um, double cross system, which was a counterintelligence network of supposedly German spies, double agents, one of them, Dusko Popov, left this memoir of Lisbon. In 1940, he wrote, Lisbon was a very special universe, a tiny enclave of neutrality where all sides in the war brushed sh sh shoulders. They all met at the Palacio Hotel, at the bar, or they were at the casino. And one of my theories about the James Bond, Ian Fleming origin, was that James Bond was born in the casino in Estoril, where Ian Fleming spent several weeks, not in the, in, in the hotels in Lisbon. 
Popov continues, it was filled with refugees of all descriptions and all nations. Some were wealthy beyond measure, like the uh, Rothschilds, and they squandered their money as if there was no tomorrow, as there might not have been. Some were impoverished to the point where they would sell anything, which usually meant themselves, unquote. Uh, despite that um, sarcastic reference, which was typical of Papa, uh, Portugal was able to take care of the refugees, even though there was a shortage of rooms, shortage of hotel rooms, people took the refugees into their homes all over the country, not just in Lisbon. And eventually, uh, the crisis uh, became uh, ma more manageable. But uh, and in Portugal, there was no shortage of food, unlike Spain, and there, and it, and there was some light. So uh, as one author recently said, this is a city of light. Lisbon was a city of light, even though the city lights of Paris were dimmed for, um, for four years. Finally, the end of the career of Sosa Mendes. We have all the documents now. Uh, I list in my handout uh, some of the better uh, works. Or there are many others I, I could have listed. To make a long story short, Salazar made the final decision, which was typical of this government system, and he condemned uh, Sosa Mendes to one year in inactivity at half pay, and then retiring him with a, uh, with a pension, but a very, very small pension. And basically, he went broke, and he, um, he died in obscurity. Um, the, one of the ironies of the story is that in the condolence cards the Sosa Mendes family received, in uh, 1954, when he died in a, basically in a, um, a, a Catholic uh, clinic, hospital, with only one niece present. Um, most of the children had, they'd migrated abroad. His wife had died. He remarried a French lady and had a child um, by her. Um, and one of the ironies was there was a card the Salazar sent with no message, but signing it, Salazar and his ministerial coat, coat of arms, um, in effect, a very strange end of part of the story. Well, we don't know really what that means, and I'd like to see some scholar look into the diaries of Salazar and see if there is any reference to, um, to Sosa Mendes. But certainly, I remember reading the literature of the opposition um, in the 60s and early 70s before the 25th of April, and you never said, saw anything about, uh, or even the, about the existence of Sosa Mendes and his example. To end with Luke 10, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus, answering the lawyer, said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, who was, when he was at that place, came and looked at, him, looked at him and passed by on the other side also. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he went to him and bound up his wounds, and pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own horse, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took two pence and gave him to the host. He gave the money to the host and said unto the host, Whatever thou spendest more, I will come and repay thee. Which now of these, referring to the lawyer again, which now of these three 
thinkest thou was neighbor unto him who fell among the thieves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Wheeler. I think that um, clearly that filled in uh, quite a bit of information about uh, Susan Mendes. Um, as you know, we're going to have a, a film after lunch, and much of what you heard you'll be able to see dramatically. So I hope many of you can stay for that film. It's, it's quite good. Um, just before we introduce the next speaker, the mayor of uh, Fall River, Will Flanagan, uh, who had to leave, but he did provide us with a citation um, which says, <clears throat> is hereby known to all that this citation is hereby conferred in memory of Aristide de Suja Mendes, rescuer, in honor and recognition of his heroic efforts saving the lives of nearly 30,000 refugees. The entire citizenry extends its very best wishes and expresses a hope for continued good fortune and success in all endeavors given this 31st day of October 2014. So we thank the, the uh, mayor and the city of Fall River for this recognition. <clears throat> um, a member of our committee, um, Rona Trachtenberg, uh, let Cindy Yokin, uh, who I mentioned earlier, know that we had, that there was a, a person who had come here a number of years ago who was very active in reviving the memory and the work of Susan Mendes. And his name, uh, and I, you know, we're talking about my colleague Howard Timberg and I teach a course on the Holocaust. And we talk about perpetrators and, and rescuers, uh, as well as bystanders, which most people are. Well, um, a rescuer is someone like Susan Mendes, but a rescuer is someone like our next speaker, Mr. Robert Jakovitz, who has helped to uh, recognize, uh, to rescue the reputation of um, Susan Mendes. He, along with uh, John Paul Abranches, who is Susan Mendes' youngest son, uh, and a few others were responsible for reviving his reputation and to honor his memory as righteous among the nations. Mr. Jacobus has for many years worked tirelessly to bring the name of Susan Mendes to the general public. For his efforts, he was awarded the Aristide Susan Mendes Humanitarian Medal by the International Raoul, Raoul Wallenberg Foundation. Uh, we are pleased he was able to join us for this conference in honor of a person who, as we have titled this conference, was a light in a time of darkness. So Mr. Jacobus. Uh, hopefully, yeah, we're a little bit behind, but hopefully we'll have a little time for question and answers, and then we'll go for lunch. Thank you, Ron. <clears throat> It's great to be here. Um, also, when we show, the, it's a docudrama. And so um, we'll have time for questions and answers after the docudrama as well, in addition to um, Doug and I giving um, some answers um, after my presentation. My role was really, um, and continues to be, is to explain to people how Sosa Mendes was discovered, or what he was really died in oblivion. But before I begin, I just wanted to recognize the Consul General again, because when I started this activity 25 years ago, um, there was still resistance within the diplomatic corps, and even, even recognizing that Sosa Menj was in history and what he did. And it was frustrating, and it wasn't until Mario Suarez became president we were able to make the headway in the final recognition. So, Consul General, Canero represents that new generation of Portuguese leaders that I am most grateful for in being partners with us in recognizing uh, Dr. Sousa Mendes. So thank you very much and your colleagues. I've worked with them throughout, all over the country and it's been wonderful to, to witness the, the change and transition that went on. So what I'm gonna do is give you um, essentially a activists 
um, explanation to what happened and uh, how it all came about. And uh, at the very beginning, I was responsible for, in the Jewish community, a um, organization called the Jewish Community Relations Council. And we are those individuals whose part of our portfolio is to, is to have an annual program to memorialize those who perished in the Holocaust. And it's part of a national holiday, not holiday, but essentially memorial in Israel called um, Yom HaShoah. The shower means the burning. The, and what it is is that we identify and have a, a program where we recognize those six million. And it's the survivors and their children, their grandchildren, and I expect even their great-grandchildren now who are now part of that lineage of witnessing what had happened with the Holocaust. And I was the JCRC director, Jewish Community Relations director in Oakland, California. It was, again, my responsibility to put this annual program together. And what we tried to do is we tried to find somebody who was exemplar of somebody who decided to do the right thing irrespective of the consequences, somebody you would call the altruistic personality. Irrespective of what they may have suffered, they knew from inside that they needed to do it. And I read, and so in my search, and every year we would find something because part of what we did was we invited representatives of the general community as well as um, the religious communities to share with us to understand the universal, universality of mankind. And that the Holocaust then, and as it's happening in other communities in different parts of the world, was just not a Jewish problem or issue, but affect all of us as people. And to try, those, try to find those people who took a stand, irrespective of the consequences that they may have suffered. And I have a bunch of, I don't have slides, but what I do is I have the original documents that I was able to bring some photocopies with me. And what I'll do is I'll show them, and then we'll have them at lunch spread out on a table so you can see them better, OK? So I, um, through this process, I read an article. In, oh, it was on March the 17th in 1986. It says, Seek, Sun Seeks to Restore Name of World War II Hero. I had been a student of the Holocaust because that was my responsibility, but I took courses, I read up about it, and we knew, we knew Raoul Wallenberg. Primarily, you know, he was the, the one and only then, and then eventually he was Schindler. And then you saw there was a, Dr. Wheeler had the slideshow of Sujihara, who was the Japanese Consul General in Lithuania, and we found out about him and Ho, and there was just really all of these others, but no one knew about them. It was either the, the survivors were so embarrassed are so angry, are so conflicted, or the survivor guilt, they didn't want to talk about it. So we weren't getting information from them, and we thought the Jews essentially were left on their own. But with the advocate at Yad Vashem, and other scholars, Yehuda Bauer, Mordechai Paldil, we started to hear these stories of people in France, in other parts of the world, the Dutch who um, were saving Jews, were hiding them, we're doing something extraordinary that they didn't need to do. And it was, again, understanding the story that John Paul Abranches, who was the 13th of Sosa Men's children, um, was telling the story along with his brother Sebastian. And they were trying on their own because they got no, they got no support anywhere from anyone because it was unknown, and people were disinterested, or they didn't believe them. He approached the Portuguese community where they lived in Northern California, and people were still not aware of what was happening, you know, and just really didn't understand or didn't care, or there were other things that were happening, and one response was, well, if your father saved the Jews, let the Jews now help you with your father. And the church wasn't terribly interested as well either. You know, times have changed, thank goodness. And John Paula Branches, because the name is Sosa Menge, because he's an American citizen, and it was a very long and aristocratic name, the last part is Aristides de Sousa Mendes de Amaral o Abranches. And so John Paul was an American citizen, he took the name Abranches. And so that's how John Paul Sosa Menge Jean-Paul Sousa Menz became a branches. And he, 
was a very gentle, very quiet man, very persistent. And he and his wife, Joan, along with brother Sebastian, did the best they could. There were articles in newspapers, but you know, we all had our 15 minutes of, of fame and they would disappear. I, as the director, read this story, called the newspaper reporter, who is named, his name is Roland DeWalt, who in fact is the child of Dutch Jews who were saved during the Holocaust. He said, yep, this guy's the real thing. And, then, and so I went and I visited him and he showed me um, information. One of them being, this is this attestation from the state of Israel identifying his father as a righteous among the nations and that he had a tree planted at Yad Vashem, um, at, again, where is the memorial for the Holocaust in Jerusalem. And if you go online, there is a listing of those who are identified as righteous among the nations. So what it is, it's a, it's, a tre it's a street at this big center. And then we have a memorials and trees planted um, in honor of those who saved Jews. And indeed, he was, again, this was in 1966. It was in the newspapers, in the New York Times, and other areas. But again, it was one of those fleeting, passing newspaper articles, and it went back into oblivion. And he was then listed as being again, a righteous among the nations, and the only one um, from Portugal that is listed there. Now, I can't tell you how many there are, but Yad Vashem, you can go on their website and they have a listing of all those, and you'll have that information there. And so I, um, once I spoke to John Paul, and this was the time before we had uh, email, and I think we just started getting faxes, if I remember correctly. So it was uh, really the Stone Age and sort of doing uh, some of this research and everything and attempting to authenticate what was happening. And I, uh, I don't know if I, if I mailed Mordechai Paldiel or called him, but some way I was able to make contact. And he said absolutely that this man was the real thing and that he was, you know, all of this documentation was researched and authenticated by, um, by Paldiel. And that's how John, John Paul's father got the designation of the righteous among the nations. And so I... Um, brought that information to my board and saying that not only must we recognize this man as again an exemplar of someone who chose to do something that he did not need to do and could consequently suffer by it, but we had an obligation to work with this man's family because what they were, they themselves were victims of the Holocaust because they suffered by it, because he suffered, because he rescued and saved Jews, and there was no one else there to be their advocate. And so really, and there have been a number of those rescuers who have suffered in their home countries, became pariahs because they rescued Jews. There's a rabbi, Harold Schulweis, um, who's now in Los Angeles, who created a foundation to sustain the rescuers. And so in their old age, they would get a stipend from the foundation to support them where they had no other ways of, uh, of survival. And so as Dr. Wheeler talked that he was Sosa Mensch, he was there at the consulate in Bordeaux. Um, and you'll see in the docudrama it all being act out. And then he was approached by Rabbi Chaim Kruger. And as you'll see what the dialogue was, but on, this, on the web page of Yad Vashem is the testimonial by Dr. Chaim Kruger. And one of the twists of irony is, well, I'm gonna quote from this, because this is part of the key to Sosa Menu's background and some of the reasons why he was severely punished by the Salazar regime when they had an investigation by um, a gentleman named Lopes, Basa Lopes, and again, one of the reasons why he wasn't, wasn't rehabilitated, quote unquote. Not that he did anything wrong to be you know, re rehabilitated, but he was not brought back into the good graces of the government and of the country. And this is what I quote from, from uh, Rabbi Kruger. This man was a righteous among the nations. He also told me that he was a descendant of the Jews 
who had been forced to convert in the Middle Ages. And most people do not know that. That even though he was a proud Catholic, he was again, you know, on the principles of Christianity, he somewhere knew that his roots were Jewish. But that did not, I don't know if that necessarily influenced him more than of his pride in being a practicing Christian. And as we saw, there was a statue at the, uh, at the country home. But he was a, such a principled man, such a principled man, that there was something inside of him that made him know that irrespective of those consequences, he needed to do something. So when I um, brought to my board that there was a need and really we had an obligation as Jews to do something on behalf of this man, um, they said to me humorously, okay, do it, but don't give up your day job. And um, I didn't, I had two, now with their consent, I now had two full-time jobs. I was running the organization and I was now creating some momentum to bring the name of Aristides Susmenj to the public, and I needed to find out how to do that. My background is in, I have a master's in social work and community organizing. So this was um, my chance to do something. And in some respects, um, when I started working on this, it was all as if the word in Hebrew is beshecht that it was destined for it to happen, to come together. I always, the analogy for me is, is that, remember some of us, um, when we would go to the, um, go on um, merry-go-rounds, there was the brass ring that was on the top, and that if you were lucky enough to get that brass ring, you got a free ride on the carousel. Well, the analogy for me was, I, I grabbed and I caught that brass ring, all right? And everything came into place. And that's why it was almost destined. That was my 15 minutes of fame. So anyways, what I was able to do, much to the amazement of many, as well as myself, is I, through John Paul and his wife, I made contact with family members who were all over the world um, because of the consequence of being blackballed, not blacklist, but blackballed in in, in Portugal because John Paul would relate to me is that when they went to classes after what happened to their father, they were ignored in class. They, you know, family members, when they saw them, turned around and walked away because of, again, the stigma of being, John, of being Sosa Men's um, children. And you'll see part of that in the docudrama as well. And then we had um, contacts in Israel through, again, dealing with one of the academics there, uh, a man named Dr. David Shapiro. And in understanding what we needed to do to try to find a way to advance this man's name, to bring his story to the world, and bring him out of anonymity, um, I ostensibly realized that I needed to both uh, put together a committee, or at least the, 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 the something that would be a committee or be understood to be a committee as well as start networking through the um, organized Jewish community and also realize that somewhere that I needed to bring in the Portuguese community because a lot of times um, you need to have a coalition. You need to have people authenticate you doing, not that it's just a Jewish issue, but also that it is a universal issue that brings all people of goodwill together and I saw it high and low for the highest place Portuguese American. And um, I once attended a dinner for this uh, organization called the American Israel Public Affairs Committee. The acronym is JPAC. And um, I, it was gen, again serendipitous. I sat at a table with the chief of staff of a, of a congressman named Tony Coelho. Tony Coelho is the highest, was then the highest place Portuguese American. And he was a congressman from the Central Valley in California, where there's a, a, a large population of Portuguese Americans. And by being the whip, he literally was the doorkeeper for when um, foreign dignitaries would come to the United States and meet with them, especially when they were in need of, um, of economic aid. And so I, I told, as I was also networking through the Jewish community, and we would get newspaper articles, we would get um, 
um, again, opportunities to, to visit uh, Jewish communities. And uh, one of the first places I visited was here in New Bedford at the synagogue. And um, tomorrow will be, ha not tomorrow, but on Sunday, we have a program there that, if I may, invite people to be there if you'd like to. It'll be part of what I'm doing here. But again, it will be part of, of again, the sort of the, the, the journey that I have taken in from the very beginning and here in New Bedford throughout the world. And I've traveled throughout the world um, when I was putting this together. So anyways, through Tony Coelho and his uh, perseverance, he um, started the momentum in, uh, in Congress. I was dealing with the state legislature in California, where, again, I was living and working. But uh, Dr. David Shapiro, who is, uh, again, was this academic, was a professor at Hebrew University, had a friend who was a teacher at a, tra a boys' trade school in Jerusalem and I had the, well, we had the bright idea is that, well, you had this arist aristocratic family, so is a mensch, and as all families, no, it doesn't, but, you know, they had a, 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 you know, a crest, arms, you know. And so um, we created a very fancy stationery that had the family crest in the middle, it was in Hebrew, English, and Portuguese. We became the international committee to commemorate Dr. Aristides de Souza Mendes. A nephew in Portugal was our Portuguese office manager. A son, Louis Philippe, in Montreal became the Canadian chair. John Paul and I in Oakland, California, he became the president, I became the executive director. Or he became the international chair and I became president. Depending on how many iterations of the stationery we would do, we put together this very formal and very important piece of stationery and we cranked out those letters. And we had, again, we had Portugal, Israel, Canada, the Southwest region, we had a child of visa recipients, Dr. Stephen Carroll, represent us there. Um, we had our own archivist, and eventually we had one of my colleagues who ran a nonprofit organization in, uh, in, uh, in Virginia became our Washington office representative. And so we then um, started the process of working towards Dr. Susan Mensch to be um, in being rep to be recognized. And once with this, um, once with this momentum, we had um, numbers of resolutions through the state of California as well as other states here in Massachusetts and in New Jersey and many other places, it really became a cause to lob for people to, un once they understood what we, were ga what we were looking for, to start that process. So one of the, um, so I have again three um, House resolutions. This one has the signature of Tony Coelho on it. Again, att attesting to who Susan Mendes was, what he did, and again, um, asking that there be recognition. We, um, we saw that, the, he, that Susan Mendes received two um, medals, recognition, from the Portuguese government. I brought with me um, photographs of those actual medals that he received, one of them being the um, Order of Liberty and then the other one being the Grand um, Cross of Christ that was, I guess, the, 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 the most significant of the medals that he received. Um, when we were in uh, Portugal some years ago, when Mario Suez um, at, the grand, at the theater there um, personally apologized to the Sousa Mendes family, as well as the time we were there when he apologized to the Jews for what the Inquisition did to the Jews in Portugal as well. I have with me, and again, the momentum. There are 70 members of Congress who all signed a joint resolution letter, again, communicating to, to President Suarez that, again, their concern with what was um, not happening on behalf of the recognition for um, Sousa Menes in, in Portugal. 
And again, Tony Coelho, when he met with the foreign, foreign minister, Cavaco Silva, who would be coming for, again, under, again, request for some foreign aid, I understand, um, sat down with him and um, shared with him that he, Tony Coelho, as the whip and a proud Portuguese American, um, was disappointed, let's say the words were, in the manner that Portugal was dealing with um, the, the, the name of Sousa Menge. And again, as um, was networked back to Lisbon, and then with the election of Mario Suarez, who was a socialist Democrat who had been in jail because of his democratic activities, he and his wife, Maria Barroso, who was an a former actress and educator, really understood, and he was, you know, here was a chance for somebody to bring in a reformist government, and he went about doing that. And so we create, that momentum was created for us, and it was a wonderful experience to finally, um, it's a, it was a, brush, a, really a breath of fresh air for that. So I'll have a number of the um, assembly resolutions, uh, senators, um, and part of what we did, as I said, we, we had a number of publications in newspapers and Jewish journals, Hadassah, um, Present Tense, a lot of places, but people don't realize is that I have a copy of one of a dozen Reader's Digests that were published because each country had a different, a different edition published. There's not one. And this came out, and they came out on December of 1998. And then this one is the priceless signature of Aristides Susmenge. So what we tried to do is, again, do that publicity to that, that information for people to, um, to know who this man was. And again, eventually, in 1988, as Dr. Wheeler said, there was recognition, and then full, full, again, recognition um, in the early 90s. You will see um, Dr. Mendez in the movie, the people would sign a ledger. He would sign a ledger as to whose name it was, and that was once on exhibit at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in Lower Manhattan, and I have a copy of one of those pages so you could see that. I also have with me, again, you'll see the writing on a visas, and he would be on a listing of visas they would taped together as people would go from one country to another or what the trail for them to leave. Again, a testimonial of a woman and the actual visa that she has. And then the other part of it is um, the International Herald Tribune on uh, July the 10th in 2013 was where the house to pass out in, again in the country was when they had the, the beginning for the rehabilitation of the building and the news that went um, um, went out as, as part of that. I brought with me, as Dr. Wheeler had, again from what I have from my archives, are pictures of the brothers when they were younger, and so as I mentioned, 45, you can see the transition he's gone through and the weariness from what he was experiencing to, again, um, the family. And of the 13 children you will see in the Dr. Drama, I was fortunate enough to meet the majority of them to visit with them in the United States or in Canada or in Portugal and to work with them. And for those of you who are philatelists, stamp collectors, there are numbers of, this is a first day cover, of a number of righteous with Sosa Menge in the middle of it as one of the commemorative um, um, stamps that came out, Israel and Portugal and uh, I'm sure there are others in Canada have come out with stamps with his, um, with his likeness on it. And so part of what, also, one of the most wonderful parts of it was is that I was, again, dealing on behalf of the Jewish community in the United States. But also, I worked very closely with the Israeli government because Israel was founded in part by survivors of the Holocaust. And part of the important thing it was is, is that, that they had an invested interest in that Sousa Mendes be recognized because of what he did in saving Jews and that, you know, you know, all over the world when a Jew is hurt, we suffer by it in the community because we're all, we're Jews. It doesn't matter what nationality other than we're Jews. And so there was that interest. 
I worked along with the um, Council's generals in San Francisco, which was the closest one to where I uh, was working in Oakland. And I was allowed to use, and so I was able to visit Portugal a couple of times and meet with the diplomatic corps there. And um, through my working with the consulate in San Francisco, I was able to work with the first woman ambassador from Israel to Portugal, whose name is Colette Avital, who is now a member of the Israeli parliament, of the Knesset. And so while we were in our manner as a community group of Jews, lobbying the United States government, then taking on, again, part of the momentum with us, Colette Avital, through the State of Israel, was also dealing with Lisbon to have them understand that they were very interested that this matter be resolved. And so I was able to, with this committee, and again, with people of goodwill, to be able to have a parallel effort, not only in this country, but in Israel. We had people corresponding in England. We visited expatriate um, Portuguese in France, and worked with us, and um, were able to really have this network from all over the, all over the world. And I have, again, um, correspondence from Colette Avital to myself, one is to me, one is even still in Hebrew that she sent to the Consul General in San Francisco to inform me as to what they were doing there. And it's always funny, it says, please let Robert Jacobitz know that Prime Minister of Portugal, Cavaco Silva, today signed in order to elevate Sousa Mendes' um, ranking. And so that was, again, part of what my trek was in uh, and again, working with the, with, you know, finding, understanding, and being able to advance the story of Susan Menge. Um, the book, one of the books I use as a reference, which has been part of the basis for the, um, for the, for the movie, is called A Man in Evil Times. Um, again, the, the story of Aristides of Susan Mendes, the man who saved the lives of countless refugees in World War II. Um, we have estimates that, you know, he saved upwards to 30,000 individuals, of whom um, 10,000 were Jews, which is, again, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those numbers. But part of what we want people to know, again, is, is that he chose to save people. He chose to save people irrespective of their background, and it wasn't just Jews. It wasn't a Jewish issue. It was a universal um, humanitarian effort that he chose um, to be involved in. And we have, I think, Doug, close to um, 6,000, well, no, I think it's li li close to, but not quite, that amount of people that we've been able to, maybe closer to 3,000, that we've been able to document. Um, and we're looking for, um, for more people and publicizing that. I was at a Jewish film festival in Sarasota, in, Sar in Sarasota, Florida, about three months ago and gave a uh, presentation. And unbeknownst to any of us, there two women stood up and said, we received the visas from Sosa Mendes. So again, there are people out there. What we ask people to do is to go and, uh, um, again, if people are still living from those times, if not, go through your family papers, and somewhere you may see the signature of Aristides of Sosa Mendes um, there and giving testimony of that because, their, um, because of his effort, they were able to... Um, to survive. You know, and one of the things that was very important to me when I brought that information to my board was that, and I had that feeling, is, is that, you know, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't because of an accident in history, my grandparents could have been petitioners in front of that consulate. And, um, and he chose to make that decision to give them. And I could not, I, you know, I may not have been here as with Harry when he was here, that if he chose not to do it, we wouldn't be here. So I, have an, I had an obligation to say that we as Jews needed to champion that cause. And um, so it's been 25 years now, and we're still um, working on his behalf and bringing the story um, to the world. And um, it's been, a, as, I can, as you can tell, a very uh, satisfying uh, part of my life. 
and it's been as part of yours, a lot of us. So um, I have my sort of my 20, 35 minutes of allocated time. We, um, I think it'd be time for, if you want to do, if it's all right with you, that, and Ron, we can open up for questions now. And um, so there, I know there are microphones on either side of the aisle here. If people want to come to either side, then Doug or I can uh, answer those questions, unless you have the ability to project, young man. Go ahead. Oh, the Dracula Dharma is not available for sale, but I have with me, what we do is, is we as the foundation, we don't own the docudrama. It is owned by a production company from France. The docudrama is in French and subtitled in English, right? I have brochures from the, um, from the foundation that I will have on the table for people, as well as my cards. Um, a number of us through the foundation are available to, um, to visit communities, to make, again, show the docudrama, and to engage in discussion. And again, the Sousa Mendes Foundation is an entirely volunteer organization. We have our own website, and you'll see, again, the names of those individuals who were saved, and other, again, documentation on the family and what we've done. So, so if that answers your question, we don't own it. We essentially have the distribution and the rights to be able to then bring it to the community um, to show it. But we'd love to be able to do that. It's just a matter of where you are, engaging one of us, and those names of people are on the, uh, around the web, as well as you have my card as the conduit to find that information. Yes, could you, can, could you please, because I think people, some people are not necessarily, do we have a, a mic that can walk around, Ron, or? Yeah, the author is um, Jose Alain Frelon, who is a French reporter. But it'll be on the table for you to view and take whatever information you want from that. I can't hear you. Kids, um, we really need to new use the microphone. Ron, is it there? Um, can we get the microphones on, on the floor? All right, are we? Okay, I hear that, I hear something. Do you all hear something? Is that red resonant? Okay, questions? Okay, we have, a, yeah, you have one. Yeah, we have one of you. You have the microphone. Hi, for Dr. Wheeler, please. Um, you spoke of people being renowned after the fact. You spoke of some being renowned during when you know, when they were getting the, 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 uh, the passports. Was there a selection process that was in place? Or was it, I mean, I saw the picture of just thousands and thousands of people, you know, waiting to cross over in Bordeaux. Uh, but how did it occur in terms of, if you know, people getting those passports were selected for them? The passports, or the, you mean? You mean the transit visas? The transit visas. Yeah. Well, it was, um, um, yeah, it really was uh, how long he could, over three days of getting no sleep with the help from Rabbi Kruger and also one or more members of his family, he signed as many as he could and then more later and more before. The, well, once he decided that he wasn't going to ask people to pay for the visas and that he wanted to give as many visas as possible, there really was no formal so it was human uh, endurance, stamina, and time. And time was limited because they were, um, uh, they, they didn't, they wanted to, to leave before the German armed forces arrived. So that was gonna happen pretty quickly by the 17th or 18th of June. And then when they went to the French-Spanish border, there was um, more signing. But it really was not, um, some of the employees, though, in those consulates said they didn't want to sign, and so he overrode their wishes and said, we will sign. So it was a very short period, and just the luck of the draw. Yeah, well, what they did was is that he, his children, and his assistant essentially worked around the clock 
signing the visas. And you'll see, you'll see the process in it. So again, there was a courtyard in front of the consulate. Ostensibly, there was a queue, a lineup of people, and the, one of the children, uh, one of his assistants would collect, or the rabbi would collect their passports, and just one by one, they were allowed in. And so there really wasn't any hierarchy. People didn't have any you know, pull, as we would say, to get, uh, to get a transit visa. It was literally, everybody was equal in getting out, and he literally was exhausted. And he really went through, you'll see a metamorphosis, a change in the docudrama as to its toll on him and again in his children and um, how they really were able to really start a little production line in getting the visas out or creating visas and creating identities um, for individuals who had no papers. Yeah, yeah, well, and see, you'll have responses to the, to the docudrama as well, and then we'll do some more questions and answers as well. If there's, we okay? Okay, good, so um, we're gonna adjourn for lunch. I'll bring out this literature, if we can find a place, and then we come back. What time do you come back, Ron? Uh, 1 no, 1.30. 1.30, 30. all right, so it's 12.10 now, so we got time for that, okay? All right, um, any other last questions now? Um, the lunch is going to be in the Commonwealth Center. It'll be in the, you'll see when you get in the back, in the uh, atrium of the Commonwealth Center, it'll be all set up. Uh, one thing is that any of you who would like to have a picture taken with uh, the, the, the um, painting that is out there of Susan Menz, um, there's a photographer there. And so you can be, you know, with the picture and they'll take a picture on, on the way out. So uh, you might want to take advantage of that.